so it's just telling me it's done recording. So here is the uh, CET 498 Capstone 2 final design presentations um, for uh, fall 2021. And the capstone process that we use, and uh, I completely stole this from uh, Professor David Broderick, is a, a simplified version of what many companies use as their as their design process. Uh, the process starts in Capstone 1, CET 497, where we do concept development and a preliminary design. And then this semester we did Capstone 2, which is CET 498, which is prototyping and detailed design and then finalising the design and prototype. And uh, apart from this presentation and the final design document, um, we are just about done. So one of the things I like to do with any course I teach um, is to uh, think about how I would do it better, right? And um, this is, uh, this is, these are some of the things that I think I'm going to do differently um, when I do capstone again. The first and most important is getting parts ordered earlier. Um, so uh, by the end of CET 497, I'm going to aim to get the next cohort to figure out what parts they need so the parts can be ordered over the summer so they're ready and available from week one. I think I'd forgotten exactly when we got parts for this cohort of students, but it was uh, after week four. So we, we sort of burnt a bit of time at the beginning of semester that we could have been more fruitfully engaged in, in work. Um, there's a, a few follow-ups to that. Um, one of them is that we need to be able to, or the students need to figure out which technology they need to use a little earlier. So one of the things I'm going to do in 497 next time around is to engage with any and all of the potential technology earlier, right? Microprocessors. I'm going to work with uh, uh, Professor Braverman, who, who also teaches the Capstone project, but also uh, the microprocessor and advanced microprocessor courses, and uh, see if we can do some small microprocessor-based projects to get familiar with the IDEs and the capabilities of each of the different sorts of processes. Um, another thing is to, to uh, some of the teams needed to be able to solder stuff together and um, that uh, rather than uh, having me do some of it, um, I, I think uh, having some soldering practice would be good. So we've, we've got some uh, small flashing LED kits that I'll, I've got a picture of on the next slide that we're going to use. I want to get students to use version control earlier. Um, we used Git for some stuff, but not much. Um, and I think from a computer engineering technology viewpoint, being able to use some sort of version control and Git is the current flavor of the, the year or so, um, I think that would be good. The other thing that I hadn't thought about, um, but two of the groups, I believe, uh, who are presenting today um, showed me is that um, it would be good to get a, a really simple mobile app developed and probably using something like React Native, which is cross-platform, uh, programmable in JavaScript. And uh, yeah, I think that that would be a good um, small thing to try and do. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how to do that, but uh, uh, I think that would equip all of the students well for being able to hit the ground running in the, the, the Capstone 2 course, the follow-up course. 
so they're the, uh, the 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 kits that I'm uh, I'm thinking about. Um, the one on the right is a, a through hole kit. It's a um, an A stable multi vibrator, so you get the the uh, the, the LEDs flashing. Um, the one on the the left is uh, a, a surface mount one that I'm I'm thinking of getting for some of the students who have already uh, done through hole soldering. Um, and uh, believe me, the those uh, resistors that you can see sitting on top of my my finger there, they're really really tiny. They're 0402s, and uh, I I I find it uh, quite challenging to not only pick them up. Obviously, we need tweezers to do that, uh, but also to to solder them. Okay, so the presentations today there's three um, the order is going to be the home security drone first then the smart fridge upgrade and then the parking automation group uh, I believe everybody should have um, uh, access to sharing so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I will get uh, whoever on the home security drone team is going to be presenting. What we've decided to do is uh, I've asked the students to, um, here we go, I've asked the students to uh, uh, present uh, perhaps a, a, a video of what they're doing. And um, the reason being that that gives us something that is is uh, uh, better than just the slide deck for um, uh, for for looking at afterwards. However, what I have asked is that the uh, the students um, be able to stop the presentation at any stage in order to answer questions. So feel free to uh, answer, uh, ask any questions at any stage, as well as at the end of the presentation. Um, and we'll we'll try and uh, uh, get any audience questions answered. Okay, so uh, yeah, Michael, go, or whoever's presenting, uh, go ahead with uh, the home security drone groups presentation. Okay. Are you guys able to see my, uh, see my screen? Mm -hmm. I can see that. Huh? So here we go. Now, uh, I can't hear anything, is that? So when you share, I think you have to, um, if you look at uh, the top right before you share, there's a, a, a an option that you have to check um, called uh, include computer sound. Good morning, everyone. There we My go. name is Michael Frederick, and I am the project leader. And today I have with me Kyle Bechtel, Bright Obing, and Jacob Nowak. And today we would like to present to you the home drone security system. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. There we go. Will the drone ever make it off the ground? Will it crash and burn? Will we pass this class? Will we ever graduate? Will this joke cost us some points? Stay tuned to find out. According to a study on home safety and security published by SafeWise on August 16th, 2021, 
roughly 40% of United States residents have no home security measures in place. Despite Americans believing that crime is on the rise, home protection measures fell by 6% between 2019 and 2020. This is concerning because approximately 63% of all burglaries in 2019 occurred on residential property. Of the other roughly 60% of U.S. citizens that are protected, the most common forms of protection are cameras, followed by dogs, firearms, and then live monitoring services. Despite cameras being the most common form of home protection, there are some limitations to them. A typical security camera is mounted in a fixed location and depending on the device can only cover an area around where it is mounted, leaving some blind spots. Multiple cameras would be required to provide coverage to a homeowner's entire property. This can end up being quite costly depending on the device and how many devices would be needed to cover the size of the property. These limitations are what we aim to mitigate with our home security drone. The goal of this project was to design and develop a home security system that utilizes a drone as its main form of detection and deterrent. Infrared motion sensors of our own design would be mapped to different areas around the user's property. When these sensors detect motion, a notification telling where the disturbance came from would be sent to the user's smartphone. They would then launch the mobile application also created by us to take control of the drone and fly to the compromised location to assess the situation. The live video feed would be streamed directly from the drone to the application. The total cost to develop this project currently sits at $158.03, although this cost may fluctuate based on new discoveries of more efficient components or implementation of additional features. We believe that our product will provide homeowners with an alternative to the typical home security systems that is unique and honestly pretty cool. Let's be honest, how many people do you know that can say they have a drone protecting their property? This project was developed over the course of two semesters. Capstone 1 is mostly about conceptual design and figuring out a direction for the project. Capstone 2 is where the required parts are ordered so that the original concept can be brought to life and presented for grading. In Capstone 1, each individual student made a project proposal. Michael proposed the initial concept for this project. The rest of us liked his idea and decided to join his group. From his concept, all group members contributed thoughts and ideas on how we should bring the concept to life. Although we were very ambitious with the original ideation, some ideas were not achievable for various reasons. Initially, we planned on 3D printing the drone frame and propellers. This idea ended up getting scrapped because we realized that we would have to spend somewhat of little time we had to complete this project and devote it to learning how to 3D print, designing a 3D model, and printing and probably reprinting the parts. We concluding that this would probably be not the best use of our time, so we decided to instead purchase a customizable drone kit. We also wanted to create a solar-powered recharge station for the drone to inhabit when not in use. We decided to remove this idea because we did not want to take on too much and not be able to finish the project. This idea could fully realize in a future update to the system. In CET 497, the main deliverable was the preliminary design document. This document explained the concept that we had at the point in time and proposed the actions to be taken to get to the final product. This was simply a way for the professor to track her progress. Our final product has changed so much since then. In CET 498, we began to narrow down the ideas and focus on what was important. In our case, the most important was thing was to have the drone to fly. Most of the time and effort spent on this project went towards making that happen. In this course, we decided on what programming languages would be used. HTML, CSS, C, and JavaScript were decided to be the best options to achieve our goals. How these were used will be explained later. 
The deliverables for CET 498 included a de detailed design document and presentation about halfway through the semester. Again, this was a way for updating the professor on our progress thus far and highlighted the changes we made from the original concept. The final design document and presentation are the last deliverables for this course. These showcase the final product and explain how we were able to get to this point. This is a comparison of the initial proposed budget against our final budget. As seen in the table, our final budget had quite a few changes from the initial. Our initial choice of drone kit had to be changed because we will not be able to reprogram the board or have enough space on the frame to mount additional components. Our final choice of drone kit was more expensive but allowed for reprogram of the board and fit everything we needed onto the frame. The Power Day drone kit that we chose for the final product came with the unassembled drone frame, CC3D flight controller, Maytech mini Michael, you've got uh, you've got a glitch. Hmm. Lost audio somehow. Wait, what's going on? Initial choice for the drone camera, but ultimately the audio was... clip cut out. It with the ESP32 cam development board, which has an integrated camera. Yes. The transmitter and receiver modules were going to be used to transmit data from the PIR motion sensor, which, but was replaced with the ESP8266, which was given to us by Dr. Kutsukis. The Wi-Fi antenna was going to be used to extend the communication range of the development board, but it turned out to have sufficient range on its own. The goal for the budget was to develop the product for less than $150. Our final total monetary cost came out to $158.03, putting us only slightly over the budget. If more features were to be added in the future, it would be reasonable to assume the total cost would increase. The schedule shown is the final timeline showing the weekly expectations and leave rubbles for the two services of the capstone project CT497 and 498. We did not miss the deadline for any required leave rubbles. CT497 covered the preliminary and conceptual design. It allowed us to lay the foundation for the final product. And CT498 covered the actual development, prototyping, and the presentation of the product. In order for this project to be considered successful, certain criteria in the form of functional and cross-functional requirements needed to be met. Those requirements are as follows. For the functional requirements, there are six of them. The first one is the system shall connect to Wi-Fi. The second one is the system shall patrol inaccessible areas. The third one, the system shall detect motion. The fourth one, the system shall be able to contact the authorities. The fifth one, the system shall be controlled via web application. And the last one is the system shall notify owner of intrusion. And for the cross-functional requirements, there is four of them. Um, the first one is the system shall be powered via rechargeable battery. The second one is the system shall live stream the camera feed. The third one, the system shall fly for a minimum of five minutes. And the last one, the system shall not exceed a maximum weight of 10 pounds. The Matic Mini Power Hub shown in the image on the left is a four layer PCB that distributes power from the battery pack to the four electronic speed controllers on the drone. The Dean's T connector for the battery was soldered to the ground and VCC inputs. The electronic speed controllers were soldered to the ground and VCC outputs. These soldered connections are shown in the image on the left.
the Ovonic 7.4 volt 2S LiPo battery pack shown in the image provides power to the drone and all its components. The battery cell composition is lithium polymer. This battery was perfect for this project because it is robust enough to provide power to the drone, but light enough to still allow the drone to get airborne. The Dean's T plug is used to connect the battery to the power distribution board. The ESP32 cam shown in the image is an inexpensive development board. It consists of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, sensors, GPIO pins, and has a CPU speed of 80 megahertz to 240 megahertz. For our project, the module functions as the receiver interface for the flight controller. The module is powered using the 5 volt pin. GPIO pins 12 through 15 are used as outputs which carry the four signals sent from the web application RC controller, throttle, yaw, pitch, and roll. These GPIO pins connect the ESP32 to the CC3D's receiver port. The Copter Control 3D or CC3D flight controller shown in the image is the stabilization hardware for the drone. This flight controller runs the Libra Pilot firmware. It can be configured to fly any airframe such as a drone, helicopter, or plane using the Libra Pilot ground control station software. Each of the four electronic speed controllers connect to the CC3D's servo outputs via GPIO pins. As mentioned before, the ESP32 CAM board connects to the CC3D's receiver port via GPIO pins. The Simon K electronic speed controllers shown in the image are responsible for controlling the speed of the motors. There are four of these and each one connects to one of the four motors. They are all soldered to the Matic Mini Power Hub as mentioned before. So this is the PIR motion sensor. And this was basically used to detect motion. And then once the motion was detected, it would send that the signal to the 8266 uh, module that I will discuss in the next slide. Now this sensor has three um, terminals one for power, one for ground, and one for data. And it was connected, each of the, these pins were connected to the, the A266 module, um, respectively, power, ground, and data. And then I also, in order to notify the user, I used the program called If This Then That, which allowed me to basically, uh, on any, motion event it would send an alert to the phone i don't really have a a video showing that due to the the time limits but trust me it worked so this is the esp8266 wi-fi module and basically it was used to receive the signal from the the motion sensor and then forward that that signal where it would basically um, send an alert to the user's phone. And each of the pins, I mean, there's a few pin uh, pinouts on, on this display here, but we only use three. One of them for power, ground, and the other for data, which I implemented within us, the, the code. Finally, the section we all have been waiting for, the application and the software. Now you're probably wondering in the beginning of the, the presentation how I was able to control a drone using a web page that I created. Well in this section I will discuss to you the web application, the ESP32 CAM module, and lastly the flight controller. So in the simplest form the web application RC controller is simply a web page and I was able to create this web page using HTML which is short for hypertext markup language CSS which is short for cascading style sheets and JavaScript 
Now, HTML was used to set up the raw structure of the web page. CSS was then used to style that structure and make it resemble an actual RC controller. And then JavaScript was used to add uh, the functionality of the web page. Now, from now on, I want to refer to the application or the RC controller as the client. Now, within the client code, I initialize the communication between the client and the server, which I will discuss later. This was done by creating a WebSocket object. And then within that object, I passed in the IP address that I got from the server. Now, the newly created object contains internal functions or methods which were used to communicate with the server. One of these functions is called the the on open function and it's basically an event handler that listens for the connection between the client and the server so once connected the client would then be able to send the data from itself to the server using the send method now the data that was being sent to the server was formatted in a json format So during the course of this project, I ran into a few issues with my web application RC controllers. And it took me actually three attempts to finally get one working. Now this first attempt as shown on the screen here was an attempt to control the drone using the movement of my phone. So any movement made to my phone would be mimicked by the drone. Now this would made possible by using the sensor API, which allowed me to expose the device's orientation and display it onto the web page, as you see here, labeled alpha, beta, and gamma. And these signals were going to be used for the pitch, roll, and yaw of the drone. Now on the right-hand side, I created a separate slider to control the throttle of the drone. And in the center here, there's an, a still image. However, this image was based, was simply a placeholder for the live stream camera that I never got the chance to implement. Now, the issue with this attempt was, I guess the signals being sent from the client to the drone was too fast and the drone wasn't really picking up on all the signals. So, I was unable to fully control the drone, which led me into my second attempt. So after the first attempt, I was confused. I didn't fully understand why the first attempt wasn't working. I thought I had an idea and I, and I ran with that idea. And due to the, the time constraint, I, I just decided to not fix it, but to actually implement a new RC controller, a simpler version, which as shown on the screen here is attempt number two. And within this attempt, I decided to just create four separate sliders since the throttle in, on the first attempt was actually working fine. And so, yeah, I just decided to just make four separate ones and each of them would control each of the components of the of the drone, the pitch, the roll, the yaw, and the throttle. Now the second attempt, however, after I tested out the drone, wasn't really practical as far as controlling the drone, because it didn't really make sense to have four separate sliders, especially given that the drone moves in a fast uh, uh, pace. So that wasn't feasible. So I decided for a third attempt, attempt number three last minute attempt and um, just by the look of it i would say this looks better uh, more practical than the other two we have two joysticks one on the left that controls the throttle and the yaw of the drone and one on the right that controls the pitch and roll of the drone and with this attempt this became the final decision for the RC controller web application.
So for the server, I decided to use the ESP32 CAM module. Uh, we decided to, to use this board mainly because it was inexpensive and it had a camera which would have been used to record motion and take pictures. But be, uh, since we ran out of time, we didn't have the chance to really implement that portion of the project. Now, to upload code to the board, I used the Arduino IDE. However, the board's library had to be imported into the IDE just to use the board. Um, the main programming language used was C and within the C code I had to import uh, specific headers and libraries to get the board up and running. Now variables were used to contain four signals throttle, yaw, pitch, and roll and in a separate function I used the endpoint of the web socket connection but remember that in the client side I use the the web socket to un initiate the the communication between the client and the server so in the server i had to to implement the endpoint code for the pin setup the pin mode of the gp or the gpio pins 12 through 15 were set as outputs next four individual channels were created for each value and uh, each channel was then configured to have a resolution of 12 bits the resolution is just a range of values to be used for example a resolution of 8 bits would consist of only 255 distinct values while a resolution of 12 bits consisted of 4000 and 96 distinct values and for the drone this allowed better control of the drone's motors next the channel was to be set at a frequency of 330 hertz and lastly the gp io pins were attached to each of those four channels that i just created now the next step was to actually connect the board to my local network using the using Wi-Fi so an IP address could be obtained and then use a, utilized in the client code. So remember in the client uh, code I created a web a WebSocket object and then inside of that object I passed in the IP address. So this IP address was the IP address passed into that object. Now this enabled the application to connect to the board via Wi-Fi. Once finished, I was then able to communicate with the server using the web application. Now, the image to the right um, is basically the serial monitor of these, the, the ESP32. And as you see, I've connected to my local network and it was given the IP address 10.0.0.200 and from the web from my web page i connected to that um the ip address and as you see here it shows the WebSocket client number one was connected and um and then i was able to then move the joysticks and send data send those movements to the the esp which is being logged in this monitor here So now it's time to discuss the flight controller. Now the flight controller is a component that came with the drone. And as you see on the left picture here, I am connecting the pins to the input of the flight controller. And so the ESP32 is, is not only the server for the, the, the web application that I created, it's also the receiver for the flight controller so it's receiving data from the client and then at the same time almost instantaneously it's sending that signal to the flight controller which which is then allowing me to to fly the drone in real time 
Now, on the right hand side is the Libra Pilot uh, software image, and this is actually the software that I use to configure all the controls. The success criteria mentioned earlier laid out the goals of this project. All but a few of these goals were met. One was successful because the ESP32 CAM development board connects to the local network. Two was successful because the drone can reach inaccessible areas through the flight. Three was somewhat successful because we had showed a demo the motion detector in class earlier in the semester and however has stopped functioning for unknown reason. Four was unsuccessful because we did not have enough time to implement the contact authorities feature. In a future update, we will embed a button in the application that will call the authorities so an intruder could be reported. Five was successful because the web app is able to communicate with and control the drone. Six was somewhat successful because we had showed a demo of the de motion detector in class earlier in the semester and however it has stopped functioning for unknown reasons. The notifications were sent to the phone when movement was detected. Seven was successful because the battery provides power to the drone and recharges. Eight was successful. Eight was unsuccessful because we did not have enough time to troubleshoot why the camera feed will not show in the web app. And nine was somewhat successful because although we cannot continuously fly the drone for that long due to stability issues, we ran a test running the morning test at full power and the battery lasted for over 11 minutes. It's safe to assume that because of this test, once the stability issue are resolved, we could achieve a flight time longer than five minutes. And 10 was successful because the drone with all component weigh about six pounds. The video you are about to see showcases the drone in flight. As you can see, it doesn't fly for very long because of stability issues. But in the future, we will have this under control and it will fly perfectly. Time was a formidable challenge throughout this project. Each of the group members has a job, additional classes, and other responsibilities to take care of outside of the project. This, in combination with differing schedules between us, made it difficult to meet the ambitious goals that we set for the project. We did not order the parts required for the project until the second semester of this capstone course which left us only about three months to build, test and troubleshoot the final product. In hindsight, we should have ordered the parts at the end of the first semester so that we will have them more prepared to get everything in working order. But at that stage of the product project, we were not entirely sure what we needed. The hardest part of this project was getting the drone to fly at all. One of the reasons being was that we decided to create a web application to act as a drone's RC controller instead of using a standard hardware RC controller. This meant that we had to program the application and then try to configure it in the Libra Pilot 
ground control station software. It proved to be not as simple as it sounds and many hours were spent troubleshooting the code. In general, this project required us to learn and develop new skills. The programming languages used in this project, HTML, CSS, C, and the JavaScript are not part of the curriculum in the Computer Engineering Technology Program here at CCSU. This language had to be learned outside of class. All of the hardware used was new to us as well. We spent many hours reading documentation and watching videos about the hardware so that we could understand it enough to be able to work with it. Every step of this project was a challenge that we took as a learning opportunity to expand our knowledge. In a hypothetical future where a home security drone goes into production, more updates and features would need to be implemented. Flight stabilization will need to be implemented as right now it is difficult to keep the drone level while it is in the air. The CC3D flight controller has an onboard gyro sensor that would be configured to auto level the drone while it is flying. Autonomous flight was an idea for the conceptual phases of this project. However, implementing it was beyond our scope in the little time we had to get this project out. A GPS module would be added to the flight controller, allowing for waypoint-based flight paths. Each of the motion sensors that would have been placed around the property would act as waypoints. When a disturbance is detected, the drone could fly autonomously to these areas to assess the situation. Collision detection and avoidance would be added. This would be achieved by adding some proximity sensors to the drone and configuring a safe stay away distance when an obstacle is detected. A simple but important update in the future would be to add the protective guards around the propellers and over the frame. This would help protect the drone in event of a crash and ensure the components stay in place during flight. Our current dyna is is just a prototype that is far from ready for production, but we believe that given more time to develop new skills and implement new technologies, we could bring this drone to a high enough standard to compete with what's pr present in the market today. In conclusion, our drone-based home security system gives homeowners an alternative way to protect their property. The benefit of our system over others is being able to cover a large area thanks to the flying capabilities of the drone. This was our first real challenge with designing and developing a product of our own. Even though it was difficult and at times seemed like we may not finish at all, we believe that we have come out of this experience with more knowledge and a better understanding of how to approach projects like this in the future. The members of this team would now like to acknowledge Dr. Peter Kutsukos for teaching this course and aiding in various aspects of this project. He has provided us with plenty of useful resources and made himself available whenever needed. For that, we are grateful. We would also like to acknowledge the other students in CET 498 for their moral support and for providing honest, constructive feedback as we progressed through this project. We also want to take some time to congratulate ourselves on a job well done we believe this product was very successful and we had a difficult but enjoyable time doing it. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed. OK, thank you very much. And uh, just a note uh, to welcome. Uh, you were not finished, Professor. Not, not finished yet. OK, sorry. Go ahead. Now we'll finish, Professor. OK, thanks. Uh, just a uh, <laughs> thanks for the blooper reel. Um, 
just to acknowledge that uh, another member of the Industry Advisory Board, Charlotte Blair, has joined us. Thank you, Charlotte. So uh, if I could get the members of the Home Security Drone, Kyle Bechtold, Michael Federick, Jacob Nowak and Bright Obank, to uh, turn on your cameras so we can see you. And does anybody have any questions for the team? So, Professor, that's not feasible for for me. That's OK. Yeah, my desktop also has no um, camera. <laughs> OK. I, mean, I could switch to my phone if you'd like. I could figure that out. <laughs> yeah, if you want to try that. I've, I've, I'm I've uh, both on my desktop and on uh, my phone. So if you want to try that, that did leave, leave on, leave this one on, but uh, uh, connect on your phone and see if we can that. So does it does any member of the audience have any questions? Particularly I'm looking to I know Charlotte have just arrived. So maybe Gary, I know Gary would, would probably have some questions or or Shushu or um anyone else. Far away. Well that was a really good, interesting presentation. This is uh Gary Felberbaum. Really good, honest uh a reckoning of the problems that you face. And I uh, appreciate some of the areas you're looking to go forward. Um, do you think the biggest challenge was the web app? If you had, uh, if you could wave a magic wand, would you have done it a different way than a web application for that control? Um. So, hi, my name is Michael Frederick. Um, I'm, I'm I'm the creator of the web app. I would say mm -hmm. the web app was the biggest issue, but equally being able to actually configure it so it would control the drone was also a, a, a huge issue. And I think I spent more time trying to configure the drone to um, to properly receive the signals and, and act accordingly. Mm. So it's two parts. It was yeah. the, it was the two, it was the two part. OK. Well, I see you have a lot of room for uh, areas that you want to explore in the future. Um, are you guys going to stay together and, and try and extend this at some point, do you think? Is it a marketable type product? I would certainly like to. Um, I don't see any project. reason not to. I think it's a very fun project to work on, and I think there is plenty of room for improvement. And um, after graduation, you know, we don't really have much else to do, so I say we should keep it going. We all are connected online, so it is a fun project. I would like to continue it probably also. Yeah, I agree with that. That's great. That's great. Um, any idea of marketing it or approaching an alarm, a, um, a security company that may be interested in something of this nature? for maybe not re necessarily residential, but so I'm thinking more like um, a warehouse or that kind of where there's a lot of area to cover as opposed to, let's say, just a residential area, which could be a half an acre or so. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great idea, um, but there is there's so much work that needs to be put into it before mm -hmm. we could even um, entertain that idea. But, you know, going down the line, should we continue working on it and improve it? I think that that would be a, a great idea, you know, to see if we can turn this into an actual marketable product. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, any other questions for the team? So uh, I think the team may have gone a little over time, guys, but uh, it, I did notice, <laughs> so that's good. Juju, did you have a... No. no, I just want to, like, I really like the presentation. Uh, the uh, oral Thank presentation you. are so good. And I, my, quest, my question probably is uh, very, like, uh, easy to answer, that uh, in your writing, do you have a like a schematic uh, model presented to describe these different modules functionality? As far as like the hardware is concerned? Right, like the design diagram. Um, we have a block diagram laid out. We don't have an actual electronic schematic. Schematic, yeah. Um, oh, because a lot right. of the components were already 
pre-built and we were just simply connecting them. Um, that's something that we probably should update and add in the future as yeah, it's useful to anyone looking into the product. Because mm -hmm. we were given a beginning schematic, but we could have made our own schematic with our additional components as well. That is a correction we could yeah. have made. Just some, uh, uh, just some general question. Yes, yeah. and also I really like that your willingness to continue working on the project. I think another way that if the future students in our capstone groups can continue working on it and get some uh, like uh, information or um, advice or collaboration with you guys, I think that may make they may have more time than you guys coming together to do it, but also you can tell, help them to further improve. I just think that's something that may be viable too. And yeah. also, I just want to let uh, Peter know that, uh, you know, I need to prepare for the meeting, so I may leave early, but okay. uh, say hi to Gary and Charlotte. Thank you so much for supporting our students. Bye -bye. Okay, thank yeah. you. I can stay so for another one. In the interest Thank of you. time, then I think uh, we may. I had did have a couple of students, but I uh, sorry, a couple of students, a couple of questions. But I did. Uh, I think I'll I'll direct them to the uh, the group afterwards. So um, let's go here and here and there. So um, next up on the uh, presentation list is the Smart Fridge Upgrade Group consisting of Eric Burstein, uh, Anthony Mizumichi and Michael Paloka. So uh, whoever is presenting, uh, I assume it's Eric perhaps, can you? Uh... Yeah, Eric's going to do it. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll share my content. Yeah, so you and just make sure you do click that uh, hear computer or uh, use computer audio uh, to make if, if there's recordings. Sure thing. Can you guys uh, see my screen now? I can, yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, here we go. All right, welcome everyone to our presentation of the Smart Fridge Upgrade. I'm Michael Poloka. I'm working with Eric Burston and Anthony Muzumechi. Here's a quick overview of what we have planned today. We'll start with an introduction, then on to the background, logistics, which includes scheduling and budget, our design process for the Raspberry Pi and for the companion application, results, which include video demonstrations, lessons learned, acknowledgements, and then references. Our project is a smart fridge upgrade a device and service made to provide a newfound convenience to anyone's normal old fridge. We've created an image capturing system that will allow you to view the fridge's contents from your smartphone. Shopping lists are a thing of the past, but if you do prefer a list, we have a feature for you as well. Most fridges that provide this technology can cost upwards of $2,000, while our smart fridge upgrade and alternative only cost $85.85 and doesn't require replacing a perfectly working fridge. The main points of research that made our project possible are as follows. Learning Python to bring out the capabilities of a Raspberry Pi Model 3B for capturing the fridge's contents. Learning JavaScript to create a companion app from the ground up. Our Mongo database that also uses JavaScript and acts as a middleman between the Raspberry Pi and our companion application. And lastly, MQ Telemetry Transport, which is a messaging protocol that is used to send instructions to our Raspberry Pi. Now we're on to the logistics. So here we have our budget, which is fully updated. We have a Raspberry Pi 3B, a Raspberry Pi IR camera, iPad, refrigerator that we have for free, the power adapter for the Pi, LED light for the fridge, an SD card, an SD card reader, Raspberry Pi 3B Plus case, it's still compatible with our 3B, and then Raspberry Pi camera cables. 
and we come at a total cost of eighty-five dollars and eighty-five cents. Compared to earlier in the year, where we were over a hundred dollars in total cost, now we're fifteen about fifteen dollars below, which is pretty nice. Now, as we continue with logistics, we're onto our schedule. As you can see from the top, we've completed everything one hundred percent up until we get to finish prototype and app. We put that at around seventy percent because we couldn't get the back end to work, storing stuff to the database. Um, let's see, continue troubleshooting the prototype, begin file design document, gave that about 90% because we finished the documents presentation, it was just, we're still in the troubleshooting phase for the prototype, and again for the finalized prototype, we gave ourselves a 70% because we couldn't finish it. But for the very end, finished final design document presentation, we've completed that. We've completed the final presentation right now, and hopefully after this, we're done. The Smart Fridge upgrade's functional requirements are as follows. The system shall allow for an inventory of food products to be taken. The system shall have one camera, which will allow for pictures to be taken of refrigerator inventory. The system shall act as an Internet of Things device. The system shall be operated via a mobile application, and the system shall be able to connect to the internet via a Wi-Fi connection. The Smart Fridge Upgrade's non-functional requirements are as follows. The Raspberry Pi shall be powered from a 120 volt 15 amp wall outlet. The Raspberry Pi's camera shall be able to withstand refrigerator temperatures. The Raspberry Pi's power adapter shall output 3.5 amps and 5 volts. The Raspberry Pi's camera shall take a picture when the user presses the Take Photo button on the companion application. The companion application shall allow the user to create text lists of any size. Now we are on to the design process. Here we have our system block diagram. In the top right hand corner, we have user input to the companion app. This is what initiates our system. So in one case, we have when the user presses the take photo button, a message is sent to the Raspberry Pi by the MQTT protocol. The Pi, when it receives that message, it initiates the camera system, which will then take the image, redirect it back to the Pi, and the Pi will then send it to the MongoDB database for storage. From there, the app system can retrieve the photo from the database and output it for the user for them to view. The user can also, from the app system, create lists and store them to the database. And then they can be retrieved as well at a later time. And then when the user has no further use for the app system, they just exit out and close the app. The initial design of the Smart Fridge upgrade was determined early on in the semester. Our product would be able to be mounted inside the refrigerator without interfering with storage space inside and without affecting the overall appearance of the outside of the refrigerator. In order to do this, the system would run off of a rechargeable 5 volt 26,800 milliamp hour battery. This would ensure no wires would be showing outside of the fridge. Our system would also have two camera modules mounted in ideal areas inside the refrigerator. Doing so would ensure the greatest amount of stock would appear in the pictures. Our device would connect to the internet via a USB Wi-Fi adapter. It would not be easy to have a hardwired ethernet connection running inside of the refrigerator without having to make modifications to the actual fridge, which was one of the driving factors of this product. The system would then be programmed to take pictures every time the fridge door was opened. This would be done by connecting a photoresistor to our Raspberry Pi and configuring the Raspberry Pi to take a picture whenever the photoresistor sends light. Doing so would ensure the user has the most up-to-date images of what is inside the refrigerator at all times. Lastly, our product will use an iOS application for the end user to interact with the Raspberry Pi. Here, the user would be able to view all pictures taken inside the fridge anywhere they are throughout the day. 
Along with this, our app will give the user the ability to create lists of items they need and lists of what items are inside the fridge using two separate sections in the iOS app. As we began to implement our initial design, we began to run into roadblocks that would force us to reconsider what we thought our product would be. The first one being how the Raspberry Pi would take the pictures. As mentioned, our intentions were to configure a photoresistor to tell the Raspberry Pi to take the picture once light is detected inside the refrigerator. However, this idea cannot be completed as the Raspberry Pi does not have room for expandability of circuit components. Our next approach with, with this was to implement a flash with our camera by programming LED strips that would be mounted inside of the refrigerator. After attempting to get the LED strips working, we noticed that they were pulling way too much current from their power supply, which led to them getting very hot and eventually damaging the part. Although we were never able to get them working, we believe that our attempt at programming these LED strips was exceptional. However, we were never able to implement our code. As a resolution, we decided to connect a battery-powered LED refrigerator light that would, re would remain on at all times. This ensured that the lighting in the fridge would always be ideal. Our next issue we ran into was implementing two camera modules in our system. Eventually, we came to realize that the Raspberry Pi Model 3B was only capable of connecting with one camera module. Referring to this picture, this port right here is where the camera is connected to. We initially wanted to have another camera connected to this port right here. However, we eventually realized that, that this port right here is only meant for display peripherals. This meant that we would have to change our design and result to having one camera module inside of our refrigerator. Next, we began to run into power supply issues. Our rechargeable battery was not supplying enough current to the Raspberry Pi, which resulted in extremely poor performance on the Raspberry Pi, eventually leading to us not being able to boot our system up at all. We decided to research and order a power supply that would reach our requirements, and this power supply would be connected to a standard wall outlet. This was beneficial to our product, however. With this, our Raspberry Pi did not need to be mounted inside of the refrigerator, meaning that our concern of condensation with the system was irrelevant now. The component could be placed anywhere on the outside of the refrigerator, so we could still accommodate for having the product not interfere with the overall appearance of the refrigerator. Another minor issue we ran into was the fact that our Raspberry Pi came with onboard Wi-Fi connectivity. This meant that we did not need to use the USB Wi-Fi adapter we purchased. However, we did notice that this also became beneficial to our product. If we had mounted our Raspberry Pi inside of the refrigerator, the internet signal would have been very weak and would have caused a lot more connection errors down the line. Lastly, we had to reconsider our programming language and editor for our mobile app. While Swift is sufficient for creating iOS apps, after speaking with our peers, we determined that being able to use this application on Android as well would increase the scope of our users that could use our product. Along with this, Swift was not able to be programmed easily on Windows machines. As everyone in our group has Windows computers, this would have caused many issues and setbacks. In the end, we determined that React Native, an open source UI fra software framework would be ideal for our case. This allowed us to create an app compatible with multiple operating systems and allowed for ease of learning as we were beginning to learn code as this project kicked off. The app would now be written using JavaScript and our editor will now use Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Changing these aspects of the app made this process much easier for us to learn and implement. With these issues in our initial design solved, we began implementation of the Raspberry Pi. The first step was to create a Python script that, when run, would take a picture and save the picture locally. Being able to do this, we would then move on to sending the picture to the companion mobile application. After ensuring that our camera script worked, it was time to implement a way for the mobile app to tell the Raspberry Pi to take a picture. Our original intent was to use MongoDB a cross-platform database that is capable of retrieving and storing files. However, we quickly came to realize that creating connections to MongoDB 
was no easy task. Eventually, we did get a connection from the Raspberry Pi to MongoDB. However, we were never able to send pictures to our database. Our next idea was to find a messaging protocol that would be sufficient for sending pictures to the mobile app. We came across a protocol called MQ Telemetry Transport Protocol, MQTT, which we were hoping would be able to meet our requirements. We quickly came to realize that pictures cannot be sent via MQTT, as it is a lightweight text messaging protocol. We decided to stick with MQTT as time was coming to an end. With MQTT, we were able to create a Python script that would have the Raspberry Pi behave as an MQTT server, where clients could connect and send text messages to the server. Knowing this, we incorporated our script for the camera into the MQTT server and programmed it to take a picture as soon as a message is received from our mobile app. This would now become the way our product would communicate and take pictures at the user's input. Shown here is the Python script used that is the foundation of our Raspberry Pi entity. From lines 1 to 3, we import the MQTT, camera, and time packages to be used in the code. From lines 5 to 8, we instantiate the camera and set the resolution and frame rate at which the pictures are taken. Following this, two functions are created, one that will execute on successful boot of the MQTT server and one that executes on arrival of a message from a connected client. When the onConnect function is executed, it will print that the connection was successful and open up connections to clients. The client would then subscribe to Raspberry backslash topic to connect to the MQTT server. On arrival of a message, the onMessage function executes. In this function, a print statement is executed showing what topic the client has subscribed to along with the message sent. Next, the camera is told to take a picture and save it to the specified path on our Raspberry Pi. The following parts of our code are as follows. The client is instantiated, both functions are called under their respected conditions, and a message is set that will be sent to the client if the MQTT server is down. The next line states which port and address the client will use to connect to the MQTT server. Lastly, the loop forever statement ensures that the connection stays open until the MQTT server is manually shut down. I decided to use Expo as well, which would help us initially with the project because it would create a blank project file for us and then it would give us simulation environments where we could test our code. And then we also need to know JS because this helped us download packages needed and it helped put together all of our JavaScript code. We also thought it was important for a simple design for easy user operation. We didn't want too many in interfaces, too many options for the user. We just wanted them to have the key aspects of what we thought this project should do available to them. We also decided that the app will be responsible for initiating a photo being taken before we were going to have it. So the refrigerator door opening and letting light in will activate a light sensor to do that. We thought it would work better if the user decided when they wanted the picture being taken. So that's why we decided to incorporate it into the app. We also thought it was important for the user to have the ability to make inventory lists. And then all the data will be stored on a cloud database run by MongoDB. The resulting Raspberry Pi entity is an MQTT server that can receive messages from an MQTT client. And upon arrival of said message, take a picture of the inside of a refrigerator and store it locally in a folder called fridge contents. The only aspect of the Raspberry Pi that we were not able to complete was sending the pictures taken back to the mobile application. Although we were not able to produce a 100% completed Raspberry Pi entity, we are confident in what we have created and found the results to be satisfying. The following slide shows the types of pictures we were able to produce along with other detailed pictures regarding the Raspberry Pi. 
The images shown here are what we would consider the best representation of the product being installed on the user's refrigerator. The picture located on the left of this slide shows how the camera was mounted inside the refrigerator. The cable was run from the outside of the fridge between where the door meets the fridge and connected to the camera mounted on the back top right corner where it could capture as much fridge stock as possible. Since we were able to use ribbon cables to create the camera connection, the cable run from outside of the fridge to the inside does not affect the insulation of the fridge. The picture in the middle shows the quality of picture we were able to produce inside of the refrigerator. Although it was not able to capture the entire fridge, being able to see what is on the door in the top shelf allows the user to view at least some contents of their fridge. We believe that this is an exceptional quality for the tools we were using. The picture on the right shows how the Raspberry Pi was mounted to the refrigerator and how it affects the overall appearance of the fridge. Using various pictures and magnets a user has on their fridge, cable management can be done at ease. We believe that this is an exceptional result as a fridge by itself does not have much room for making our product look presentable. Now we're on to the results of the companion app. We do have a functional app. You'll see that with the next two slides, but we were not able to meet all the requirements we set out for it. One of them being that the Pi camera shall take an image when the button is pressed on the companion app. We weren't able to get that to work. We do have the code, however, that does that. So in the next two slides, you'll see when we send um, the message over through MQTT to initiate the code on the Pi, it works, but we just weren't able to integrate it into the button portion of our app. And then the other issue being the backend software. So we chose MongoDB as our database, and we had issues from the get-go trying to configure it. But it was our best solution for what we were looking to do. So we had to stick to it. And we just couldn't get it to work. So we weren't able to store our images to the database and retrieve them. And then we weren't able to store our lists to the database. So when a user would make a list and then move out of that screen and go back into it, their list would be reset back to what the original layout was. But we do have all the front end interfaces. So when you're going through the app, everything that you would expect to be there is there, just the back end functionality isn't working 100%. The following is a video demonstration of the Smart Fridge upgrade. Currently, we have our Python script up and running, showing an open connection for clients to connect to. With everything set in place and the camera mounted in the fridge, I will now have Michael from his own home network send a message over to the Raspberry Pi to uh, take a picture. As you can see now, the message take picture has appeared and an image has appeared in our fridge contents folder. And this is the picture that was produced. All right, so now we're on to the video demonstration of the companion app. I'm gonna start the video, it's pre-recorded. So here is a SFU title screen with a Let's Get Started button on the bottom. We're gonna click that and it brings us to our menu page. On our menu page, we have the fridge photo button, inventory list button, and then a need to buy list button. So the first one we're gonna go into is fridge photo. And now you'll see we have a take photo button what we would have liked was for the user to press the take photo button, a ping to be sent to the Pi or a message um, through the MQTT protocol that would initiate the code on the Pi, causing it to take a photo of the fridge inventory, send that photo to the Mongo database, and then the app would retrieve it automatically and display it right below this take photo button. We were having issues with setting up MongoDB Unfortunately, couldn't get that finished in time. Now we're going to go back into the inventory list. Here, you'll see there's a new entry where the user will click on it, type in their entries, and then press Add to Inventory to add it to the list. And the list is already occupied by this tap to remove. This is just to show users how to delete items. So there you see it's tapped and it's gone. 
now I'll go through just adding items you would put in the refrigerator, eggs, milk, bread, I think the next one's cereal. And ice cream. Now I'm just going to hit the add to inventory a few times just to show that the list can be of any length and you can scroll down and see all the items you have in there. And then you can just tap them all away once they're no longer necessary. Now we're gonna head back and go to the need to buy. Same layout, we get rid of that example entry we're just going to run through this again just to show same functionality on this side. We're just going to put a bunch of eggs in the list. We're going to go ahead and delete them all. Now, unfortunately, we also had an issue with the list with saving and retrieving the data. We were going to put them onto the Mongo database and then retrieve them when the, when the app um, is loaded up. But because we had issues with connectivity, we weren't able to do that. So as you'll see in a second, when we go back in, the screen resets on both of them. Our lessons learned throughout the project are vast, but to narrow down the information, the most important are recorded here. Group work. Working in a three-person team for a project of this scale taught us to divvy up the work accordingly and to create a fair amount of documentation on any adaptations made to the original work so it can be traced back and make the necessary revisions according to the group. Time management played a huge role in this project. Making something from the ground up is not easy and holding yourself to deadlines becomes critical to keeping a healthy schedule. Programming. Originally, one group member had a foundational understanding of JavaScript but this project required us to go beyond foundational and learn a variety of different things within JavaScript, Python, and MQ telemetry transport. As for our acknowledgements, we personally want to thank Professor Katsukus for his supervision while undergoing this project and holding us accountable for our deadlines throughout the semester. And to Professor Broderick for being a sturdy wall to bounce any questions off regarding equipment issues we worked through to make our project possible. And lastly, to my group members for giving 100% to the group and making this project to be a joy to be a part of. Finally, here are just our references. Took about three slides. Take them all in. We'd just like to say thank you again to everyone for coming today and watching our presentation. Okay. Um, does anybody have any? questions for the team and again if if the uh you could turn your cameras on if you have cameras and so we can see you that would be good uh, so there's trying to get my camera to work <laughs> that's okay anthony try it okay does anybody have any questions for the smart fridge update upgrade team So I, I there, you go. there we go. I wondered what, what was the actual, did, did you ever get to the uh, identify root cause of the MongoDB issue? What, 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 what's the connectivity problem? Do you... Okay, so on the app side, we can get it, we can set up the connection and it will console log and it will show us connection made. But it, the process of sending the data and retrieving it no matter what tutorial video I watched on how to do it, nothing worked, no matter what I did. But when we tried in Python, maybe like the last day me and Eric were working on it, we tried a little snippet of Mongo in Python and we were able to send text. Okay. But that doesn't really help us in the app because the app's written in JavaScript. Right. Yeah, I so one of one of the um, 
truisms that I've always come across is uh, in doing development is, quote, it's always permissions, unquote. So that, that would be my suspicion, whether it's network permissions or database permissions or something along that line. OK, um, we are running a little late, so is, is, I think we can maybe take one other question if anybody has one. Otherwise, thank you guys. A thank good you. presentation. Thank you. And uh, we'll uh, let me just go back here. And so the final presentation is uh, the parking automation team. And we have Fahim Ali, uh, Kyle Fields, and Michael Gallagher. So whoever is presenting, I assume it's Kyle probably. Yep. Um, if you want to take over and uh, share your screen and uh, get that uh, audio button on. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. And you can see it all right? Yeah, I can see that now, yes. Awesome. We are developing the parking automation system, which is an effective system to determine the number of cars entering and exiting any parking lot or garage. It notifies the driver of the available amount of parking and provides a time efficient method of identifying an available parking space in any type of parking area. Traditional parking can be frustrating and time consuming experience that requires an extreme amount of impatience. Currently, a typical parking scenario calls for hunting down a parking lot near the destination, hoping there is a spot available, looking for the openings yourself, and finding another parking area if that one is full, only to repeat the tiring process all over again just to simply find a parking space. Our system will alleviate the excess time wasted in this process. By providing indicators for parking usage, the parking automation system reduces the hair pulling stress of finding a parking space, especially if you're in a hurry. The system eliminates pointlessly entering a full garage as well as significantly lowering the amount of time that it takes to find a parking space. This is very handy for avoiding showing up late to any event or meeting. In order to implement the parking automation system, infrared sensors are used to detect incoming and outgoing vehicles. For the system to be effective, it is set up at the entrances of the parking areas that an administrator wishes to set up. The parking automation system is most effectively implemented on any parking garage or lot that is regularly congested, such as in cities and colleges. The project was completed in multiple stages, each lending their own value to the overall success of the team. The first stage, which ran through the majority of spring of 2021, was the preliminary design of all content. Along with preliminary documentation, an early presentation and some budgeting took place. During the fall of 2021 semester, the design was finalized and implemented into a pre-prototype that acted as a proof of concept. This pre-prototype was a fantastic tool for troubleshooting on a manageable scale for the team. In addition to the parts ordered for the pre-prototype, more parts were ordered to implement the actual full-scale prototype so that it could function to the best of the requirements stated in the documentation. The prototype was then created and tested and will be demonstrated in the presentation to follow. The end goal that the team perceived from the beginning of the project was to create and test a functional prototype that met or exceeded as many requirements as possible before today, December 10th. The block system diagram shown here is designed to provide a basic structure of the functionality. As a vehicle enters the parking lot, the parking application uses its infrared sensors to detect the vehicle and notify the program loaded onto an Arduino development kit. When the vehicle leaves, the IR sensors will detect the vehicle leaving and communicate with the software to allow another parking space to be open. The block system diagram, although basic in nature, has a valuable application in providing a bigger picture of the project as a whole, and the basic structure makes the system easier to follow for both the team members and those on looking into the project. The use case diagram, as shown, designates the primary functions of the parking automation system. Primary components include the display, a physical LCD display used to indicate to the user the amount of parking space that is available, the Arduino development kit, 
which acts as the brain of the system, and the infrared sensors. The display is located at the entrance of the parking area, dictated by the parking automation system. When a vehicle enters, the system must confirm parking occupancy and alter the stored values based on this action. When a vehicle leaves, it will again alter the database of stored values, and any collection of the information is initiated by the two infrared sensors external to the main device. Once this information is collected, it then passes through the Arduino for the LCD display to output to any users. Which has five devices, an Arduino, LCD display, two IR sensors, and servo motor. I will talk and explain how each device works in this circuit or in the system. I will start in the Arduino, which Arduino is the main important device in this circuit, which control all other devices. How the Arduino control all these devices is by the software. And how the software work is by the code we download into it, into the software. And the second part, the second device is the LCD display, which is notified the drivers, how many spaces available in the parking lot. And the other two devices is the IR sensors, which the first sensor work when there is a car or an object entering the parking lot, I will open this gate, which is the servo motor, and update the LC display with the how many spaces left. Same thing, the IR sensors is detect any car leaving the parking lot. I will open the motor and update the spaces information in the LCD display. How is this devices connected to the Arduino? Um, we try to make it clear and easy for anyone to understand how is the system are connected to the Arduino or between its devices. But I will explain a little bit about how we wire those devices. Like you see, the LCD display has four bins, one bin for power supply, which connect to the five volt power supply in Arduino, and the second bin for ground, which connect to the Arduino ground, and the third one for SDA, which is the serial data bin over which the data send it between the two devices, between the Arduino and the LCD display, and the fourth bin, it's is the SCL bin, which is the clock bin. We use four bins of the, L the LCD display. And those two IR, IR sensors, they have, each one has three bins, one for power supplies, one for ground, and the middle bin, which the out bin is going hooked up to one of the sensors goes to the core for the data send it between the two devices. The servo motor has three bins, one for power supply, one for ground, and the middle one is for out, which connect to bin three and Arduino, and that's for the data send it between the servo motor and the Arduino. Like I said, I think there's nothing to talk or explain about how the diagram connect, how the devices and this diagram connecting each other. We, try, we tried our best to make it easy and understand for anyone by looking at it. The protecting casing that we designed for the um, whole system, you can kind of see from the diagram, uh, it, it's see-through. So on the front, we have an opening for the LCD screen. And then in the bottom, there is a small housing for the actual Arduino. Um, we plan to just tape down the battery in there because we'll be having to take it out. So taping would be the easiest way. Um, on the side, we have a cutout for the servo motor. 
to where it would sit preferably in there we would have to glue or fasten it to the outside of the box we also have two small openings for the two wires to come out of the arduino for the ir sensors so in actuality if you were to 3d print this you would be able to put the system inside have the two sensors um, coming out of the box to each post or wherever you want to set them up and then you have the servo motor in the middle A detailed success criteria consists of both functional requirements and cross-functional requirements. Functional requirements are necessary for the project to operate as desired and can alter the functionality of the overall project if they are not completely operational. Cross-functional requirements are extra requirements that enhance the ability of the project. These cross-functional requirements can also enhance the ability of functional requirements as well by giving them additional abilities, range, data collection, or anything that can make a functional requirement more effective in the project. These cross-functional requirements generally come secondary to the functional ones in terms of task priorities. The functional requirements are as follows. The parking system shall give drivers live, real-time data on the status of each parking lot. The parking system shall notify drivers of unavailable spaces. The parking system shall notify drivers if there is an accident on the parking lot, such as collisions. The parking system shall notify drivers if the parking lot slash garage is out of service. The parking system shall notify drivers of empty parking spaces. The parking system shall notify drivers of how many empty parking spaces there are per level. The cross-functional requirements are the following. The parking system shall have no capacity limit. The parking system shall send sensor data within seconds when a parking spot becomes available. The parking system shall be sensitive to motion to recognize if the parking space is occupied or empty. The parking space should be able to respond to motion for space usage. The parking system shall be powered by a long life battery with minimal energy consumption from the active hardware. Challenges. Although preemptive organization was a large factor in preventing some challenges, such as mismanagement of resources or confusion on deliverables, there were still several challenges that the team had to overcome. Gathering components was a double-edged sword. On one hand, the team had to wait for parts to come in, temporarily delaying progress on the project pre-prototype. However, this gave the team more time to accumulate more research. Some parts were already acquired through previous individual projects in the past, but were underwhelming for the scope of the project. These parts made for excellent testing components on very early iterations of the prototype. Another challenge that occurred throughout the early lifespan of the project was working with the software required to function the Arduino, and how to combine separate classes built for two different peripherals so that they can function as a single unit. This required the team to become familiar with the working language of Arduino, C++. Getting the software to then communicate with the hardware available was another challenge in and of itself. Although Ar Arduino is made to make this seamless, some of the components needed further assistance and more code to work properly. Along with research for other components, this caused for extensive research throughout the entire project research lifespan. Challenges also arose from the infrared sensor hardware. Because of the limitations of the Arduino's compatible hardware, 
the infrared sensors were not as effective as the team had hoped. Because of this, the team was forced to work within the limitations of the sensors. These infrared sensors were sen sensitive to extraneous light and would need to be replaced with more powerful versions in a later iteration of the parking automation system. Alongside our challenges, the team also had learned some important lessons throughout the project lifespan. First, these lessons was proper documentation. Early on, it became evident that proper documentation of the deliverables is required to have a smooth project timeline. The documentation the team was able to provide themselves and others a mostly accurate timetable in which deliverables were to be received, along with what components do and how sections of the project function. Further along in the project, the team learned that it is a necessary part of project development to not only complete deliverables, but to properly delegate tasks keep the project within the schedule and truly work as a team rather than three individuals. This way, if one team member was having trouble completing their given tasks, they would feel comfortable when asking other team members for help. Working from the ground up on the project also assisted in bringing the team closer together and really giving each member a chance to contribute. Having a small team certainly helps in getting to know the team members and what they are good at. And throughout this project, Working as a team caused each member to realize what they can provide to the project. It's shown and explain everything about each part, cost and quantity. We have the item description, unit cost, quantity, and total. We have an Arduino Uno R3, free cost, got it from school. Servo motor, unit cost $8.99, quantity one. Total cost $8.99. IR sensors, unit cost $10.99, quantity two, total cost $21.98. LCD display, unit cost $7.99, quantity one, total cost $7.99. Servo motor, pack of five, unit cost $9.99, quantity one, total cost $9.99. And 99 cents. Adafruit power post, unit cost $23.01, quantity one, total cost $23.01. The total cost for all parts and this project is come up to $71.99.96, which we try from the beginning to eliminate expensive part and make a and cheap rate try our best to design our system and make it available with cheap price. In the beginning of the project, a schedule was created to keep the team on track and able to focus on individual tasks. Although the schedule is not perfect, as there are always some deviations to every plan, most of the schedule was adhered to. During the early days of the spring semester, a project was chosen and a preliminary design proposal was created. The purpose of this proposal was to have a basic idea for what the final project would look like when it began to take shape. A preliminary presentation was then made as a precursor to this final presentation. It provided basic information on the future of the project as well as guidelines for the team members to follow in the creation of the final prototype. During the next semester, in fall of 2021, the design proposal was fleshed out into a detailed design document which properly explained the extent of the project now that the project team had begun to accumulate experience. Resources, such as software applications, components, and more, were gathered soon after. After another presentation, one with far more detail than the original, the pre-prototype was made. This pre-prototype marked the beginning of material creation and documentation. Now that there was tangible progress, team members were able to document what exactly would be required for the prototype to be created. So that the project would operate properly, dimensions for components had to be taken. Once everything was ready, the prototype was made and tested using experience from the pre-prototype construction to assist. The prototype was tested and the test was recorded. After the documentation and presentation was made, a wrap up indicated by this recording went underway. This included backing up documentation for later reference and double checking all the documentation for accuracy.
Throughout this project, it has come to light that garage parking automation is necessary to improve the quality of life within communities that have this sort of issue. Having the system in any crowded or confusing parking garage can lead to limiting wait time or time searching for a parking space almost completely, or at least bringing that time down significantly. The project feasibility is fair as the budget for the first prototype and research is valued at around $65. The budget is accomplishable when accounting for what the final product can perform and all the parts are readily accessible to basically anyone who wants to attempt something similar. Despite unforeseen unforeseen circumstances that may arise that we cannot account for, the implementation plan that is proposed in the schedule is on par with what we need to complete in each exact week and time. With the use of data as well as real-time notifications to whoever is using the system, the device should be able to direct and guide said operator to the closest and available parking spot. In regard to repeatability, if all the parts are present as well with the instructions, this project would be able to be implemented after the initial prototype is done to basically any parking garage that requires it. If faced with a similar issue, this project should be able to be adapted to any parking garage for the ease of access and quality of life improvements necessary to be implemented. Overall, the need for this project and system is to improve the struggle that many people face when entering a parking garage and finding an open parking space. Now, through testing and completion of this project, we can surmise that the prototype would work well. However, I think that we could have made some changes early on that would have made this project better. The IR sensors that we chose have a little bit too short of range. So if this project was to be updated in the future and redone, we believe that sensors with a bit larger range would be required. However, when testing the smaller scale prototype, it worked as required. This project came as a small challenge with getting the necessary materials we needed and had a few issues with time constraints, but overall we believe that we completed the task that was presented to us and did so with fairly good accuracy and execution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Fahim, Kyle, and Michael G. Um, Kyle F, I suppose. Uh, so uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning on your um, uh, cameras, if you've got them, and uh, so we can see you. There's Michael. Um, Thank you, just one second. No worries. And if uh, somebody can, um, is there, if anybody has any questions, I have a couple, but uh, I can, I, I'll defer to uh, somebody from the audience if there is anyone. Hi, this okay. is uh, Gary uh, Felberbaum again. Um, besides the infrared sensor, what would be another area that you would really want to uh, look into to extend the product uh, in, in terms of either usability by the parking garage administrators or by clients looking for a spot to park their car? Um, oh, go ahead, Kyle. All right. Uh, sorry, Mike, I cut you off. I just wanted to check. <laughs> no, you're good. Swap computers. Go for it, Mike. Um, I mean, I think one of like our biggest challenges was with the IR sensors. Um, we didn't really, I guess, account for the short range. So, I mean, if we chose a different model that had even like six inches bigger range, I think that would, um, make the functionality more feasible. But I think if we um, potentially use a different like parking lot or area to actually do the full scale, I think we would have had some different results. <clears throat> but overall, I think um, that would probably be most of the changes, at least on my end. OK. Um... It's a really interesting project and something that we all need and use. I was also thinking of things like um, uh, maybe having an internet connection 
to the Arduino so that a garage could say we have availability in terms of, let's say, percentage, not necessarily number of spots. OK, this one we have 10 percent available or 90 percent full. I was just thinking in more in that direction. Um, and the only other question I had is, were you planning on putting some sort of a sensor in each space such that as you go into the garage, because you said something about each level, yeah. but you really it, only had, what were you thinking of there? Initially, uh, our plan was to do uh, sensors in every single parking spot, uh, mm -hmm. but obviously having to you know, purchase sensors for every single spot is incredibly uh, cost inefficient. So uh, we had to keep scaling down as we like narrowed in a budget for it. Um, mm -hmm. So the next one was we wanted to do one per like level, and then by the end of it, it was one for the parking lot entrances. So, uh, and we so just found if, that to be more straightforward and uh, more cost effective. True, and it also, um, at the end of the day, if you, I mean, in most parking garages, that would be sufficient. It's only some really, really large ones where you would still be circling looking for that last three spots or something like that, where it could be helpful. So I was just curious what your thinking was there or a different type of a sensor like uh, a camera system to recognize whether or not a spot is open or closed. So it'd take a wide angle kind of a picture. Um, yeah, that would be that would be actually really cool too. Uh, the other thing that we were concerned about when we were doing this was, uh, I guess, survivability, right? And that's why we had the the CAD, the 3D model, the box mm -hmm. uh, made for it was to help with survivability. And uh, mm -hmm. some of the uh, devices can get damaged very easily, such as like cameras and stuff. So that's why we avoided that initially. But it would certainly be a lot cooler, maybe a little bit more effective. Yeah, 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 from the from the experience we have done in this class, we able to upgrade the system. We able to upgrade added sensors to each spot. You know, that's not by the drivers. You know, it, where is the empty space and how many empty space in each level and with the space mm -hmm. number. And like you right. mentioned with the camera, you know, show camera like each space where is available and empty. Why not? You know, these days is ton technology is available. And like I say, with the experience, we've been testing the our project with the um, application we wrote. We have the knowledge to upgrade it in the future. Sounds great. Well, thank you. It was a great presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, I guess it's towards Michael on your comment. I will let, just let me say that uh, the team's presentation was uh, very good. I could see it's very professional. I like the idea you were forward thinking about thinking of the environment. But I was curious as why you uh, stated that if you had a different uh, um, parking garage. Um, I mean, we we didn't get into too much detail on it, but we we use the garage at Central and. We kind of thought after the fact that maybe the lighting in the garage trips the IR sensors or doesn't provide enough lighting like on said car, like like the shadows um, could affect how these sensors pick up the car. But we didn't do too much extensive testing into it. It was just kind of like an afterthought. Basically, the uh, 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 more than a general IR sensor you would uh, have selected yeah okay yeah because those ir sensors is very sensitive to that daylight and that's where mike you know mentioned we use this test at open light parking lot and maybe those you know the the problem it doesn't make the ir sensors work perfectly the way we want to we're looking for thank you very nice work Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Um, I think you've been grilled enough, so uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> I'll I'll leave my questions. I'll I'll put them in the uh, my notes. Um, 
Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, all the students, for presenting. I'm very happy with uh, with the result. I think that's 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 a, I think it worked out well. Um, I'll have to be a bit more cognizant of timing next time, but I think uh, it's it's mostly on time. Um, I the only other thing that's uh, outstanding for the capstone students is the final uh, design doc. I will be sending you your peer feedback um, shortly, sometime later this afternoon, so you can see that and take it into account. And uh, well done. Thank you very much for everyone's time. And uh, let's leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Yep. Yes, thank you, Professor. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, yes, it has. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, see ya. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Gary.